Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence through our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. I come with praise and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for your love and your grace toward us. We are very conscious of the limitations of our understanding, the energy of our enemy Satan, the persistency of the flesh. I ask that the Holy Spirit overrule and take charge of the study, that he would filter out that which is carnal, but seal to our hearts that which is spiritual, that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going through Colossians now, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we would reached verse 5 of chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. I want to say right here at the outset that uh, some of what you're about to hear in this video is, uh, it's not that I've strayed from the text, but I've looked at other passages of Scripture which help interpret the passage that we're looking at because scripture interprets scripture we see that it was god by his determinate power his will his power uh, that who selected paul as his apostle and i believe that we're looking at the mind and the heart of the holy spirit here not the reasoning of paul i've mentioned this before in other studies and it is God who says that he rejoices that we trust in Christ Jesus, that the sovereign monarch of the ages, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who hung the stars in the heavens, actually is thrilled that we trust him. I've mentioned on numerous occasions that my belief, I've expressed my belief that I believe how that I believe that the most important thing that uh, or the one thing that God desires the most of us is that we trust in him. And what is the converse of that? It's that we're trusting in ourselves. So it is God who says that he rejoices that we trust in Christ Jesus. And we see from the text that there's there is always an attitude of thanksgiving and an attitude of prayer and worship concerning the believers there at Colossae. Not only concern for one another, but, but we see God's concern for us. And what a wonderful thing to realize that we're constantly in his care, that he, he's constantly concerned with us every moment of every day. And nothing touches your life that has not been filtered through his loving hands. Through the sovereign purpose of a loving, heavenly father. So beginning at verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, being preserved for us in the heavens, plural. If you look at that in the original text, it's heavens, plural. Nothing can destroy that hope. Nothing. I mean, just in that one verse, folks, you see eternal security. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. I believe the simple approach to this is that before they trusted Christ, they heard the word of the truth of the gospel. If we look at that in the Greek, we have the word the truth, the gospel. And I, I don't imagine that we could cover in a month, let, let alone in one video, all that's wrapped up in those simple words. Our only source of truth, folks, is this book. It is simply staggering when, when you know, one contemplates how much error is alongside the truth of the Word of God, especially in these days in which we are now living. I'm sure you all know that the Lord Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. It's Christ himself who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we generally conclude 
that the gospel, euagelion, the gospel, the good news, is about Jesus Christ. And I see a simple focus in the close of this verse, that the word of the truth of the gospel is in fact the person in the work of Jesus Christ. There are at least eight verses which say Paul preached the gospel, and the Holy Spirit has us read in the eight, 18th chapter of Acts that what he did, what Paul did for a year and a half in Corinth was teach the word of God, and in the last hundred years or so, there's been a rapid separation between the word of God and the gospel. We've made a tremendous differentiation between teaching the word and preaching the gospel. You know, some preach the gospel, you know, they're not qualified to teach. They leave that to somebody else, and we call that a follow-up ministry. You know, thinking that the gospel is not an in-depth Bible study. I believe the Holy Spirit has clearly said that what Paul did in preaching the gospel was teach the Word of God. I don't see how it could be any clearer. He stayed there for 18 months and he taught the Word of God, and I don't think that we have the right, any right, to take the word gospel and say that that deals with, well, that just deals with a few verses, and then all the rest of it is something else. You know, that's for scholars and, and Bible students and I mean, folks, you are all students of the Word of God to some degree. What they heard in the Word of the truth of the Gospel was the Word of God. What they heard in the Word of the truth of the Gospel is what they heard from, from uh, Ephesus as he carried that message to the believers at Colossae. I believe one inspired by the Holy Spirit came and talked about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and they trusted in him. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, verse 6, which is come unto you as it is in all of the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. A number of commentaries, they, they've got the Apostle Paul exaggerating just a bit. I've noticed that they really tend to do that a lot. You know, because you and I all know that it didn't come into all the world. You know, this is one of the eight verses which says it did. I believe the Holy Spirit defines the world as a system in which people exist. In fact, the field is the world in which there is tare and wheat, in which there is a variety of soils, and there is seed sown. And I conclude that in that world system, God planted his children. And, that, and that's the only place that his word has to go. I don't think the Holy Spirit is given to exaggeration. Folks, if you define the, the world as the globe, then you're telling me that at this time when Colossians was written, the word went forth unto China, Mexico, South America, Asia, India, Russia, you know, North Korea, you know, the, or, or Korea. There wasn't any division at that time. Uh, the, the Native Americans, everybody. Okay, but this text is showing us that we're not defining the world as all mankind. We're defining the world as a system in which God sowed seed. Satan came and sowed bad seed. God didn't sow it. Verse 6, In all the world it is bearing fruit and increasing, that is what the original text says, the original Greek. It's bearing fruit in, you see, Epsilon knew there, in, it's bearing fruit in all the world, and it's bearing fruit in you. Twice, the word in is seen there in the original text. The scriptures declare that in that world system, God sowed only his children. The good man sowed seed. While he slept, an enemy came, and his servants came to him and said, You know, there's tear among the wheat, 
You didn't sow good seed. He said, I did not do this. An enemy did this. Lord, declare unto us the parable. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of God, the sons of the kingdom, the tare, the sons of the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So God didn't sow them. He couldn't be any clearer. And yet I've had people stomp out of Bible classes when I say God didn't sow the tare. When our Lord himself said, I did not sow them, an enemy has done this. The enemy is the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So God didn't sow them in the world system. He had to, he had to buy it back. You know, he, he so loved that system that he bought it back so that all who believe on him do not perish but have everlasting life. The question is, did they get that everlasting life by believing, or do they believe because they have everlasting life? And I think that that question, uh, uh, well, I, I think that that questions your understanding of God's grace and the Word of God. It determines just how much you understand God's grace. The truth is that he has a world system in which he sowed his own seed. He bought it back for the treasure that was in the field. The treasure, folks, is you, not redemption. It, the treasure is you. Okay? And he bought it back in the person of his son. So the word went where it needed to go. So that Paul could declare in the 15th chapter of Romans that he totally evangelized an area of, you know, about a million two hundred thousand square miles with no, no TV, no radio, no, no Dodge Ram pickups, no, uh, no ATVs, no airplanes, no trains, you know, no four by four Jeep Wranglers, you know. Every place that God wanted that word proclaimed, it was. And every place that it's proclaimed, it brings forth fruit, just as it does in you, since the day that you and I heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Isaiah chapter 55, you all know the verse. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ so that his seed will hear. But we also know that they will hear. You know, we, we, can, we can do nothing to make people hear, folks. That is God's responsibility. You know, you should be willing to allow God to be concerned where God ought to be concerned, and you be concerned where you ought to be concerned. I see so many people desperately concerned about the plight of the lost, yet very little concerned about their own spiritual growth in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God sent forth his word. It will accomplish what he pleases. In the original text, it speaks, in, in the Greek, it speaks of hearing and growing, or, or bearing. Is the, the, it speaks of bearing and growing. The bearing is a middle voice and the growing is a passive voice. They're both the same construction. I believe that the bearing is middle because we participate in the bearing of that fruit. The growing, however, you have nothing to do with. That's passive. That's what the Word of God does. God causes the growth. You know, one waters, but God causes the growth. And the only growth that you'll ever know is in this book. The only growth that you'll ever come to know comes through the Word of God. I am firmly convinced that this verse is saying that your only source of spiritual growth is the Word of God and that it works. 
doesn't return unto God void. You don't have to make it work. It is, it's a passive verb. You hear the word of God and you will grow. You will grow. Since the bearing of fruit is middle, then we as the subject participate in the bearing of the fruit, but we don't have any participation in the growth. The growth is the power of the word of God. It not only did this in the believers at Colossae, it does this every place it goes. And there's hardly a church anywhere that I know of that doesn't concern itself with growth. But they tend to define growth as, well, as more members or, or you know, more musical instruments or more space. And, you know, it's, it's growth in space, not growth in grace. The great concern is, you know, I think we are saddled with the responsibility of, of handling the Word of God correctly, not handling it deceitfully. How could somebody stumble onto one of these videos and not be enraptured with the grace and the mercy of our amazing God? I've heard people con say, say as much in comments and stuff. We fellowship together in the study of the Word of God, and if that study is not the kind of study that somebody else needs, the Lord will lead them someplace else, folks. Okay? God wants someone on this channel. He knows how to get them here without bait and guile, okay, or entertainment, you know, or flashy new intros like you, maybe you've seen in the beginning of this, of this video, something that you haven't seen before with our title, Blessed Hope for, you know, sorry about that, I just couldn't resist, it looked really, really cool, but Lord, uh, Lord have mercy, folks. We have got to handle this book honestly, with integrity, with sincerity. We've got to be serious students of the word. We can't handle it deceitfully. And God will take care of all that, all the rest of that. The word know there in the text is experiential knowledge. And God says, it'll accomplish what he pleases. It may not accomplish what I please, but it will accomplish what he pleases. It's folks knowing this and believing this, folks, is the only thing that keeps me on the level. Okay? It's just my trusting in him. Concerning all, all, all of this, all things. Who comes? Who goes? How many subscribers, how many numbers, how many views, all that. You know, to be concerned, I can't be concerned about all that, folks, and, 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 and concentrate on the text, okay? I can't. I'd rather spend my time studying this book. They not only heard the Word of God, but they knew the grace of God, and grace is the great doctrinal divider between the liberal and the conservative. It's the, the very barrier between Protestantism and Catholicism, okay? The liberal believes that man is growing and getting better and better and better and therefore less and less needs the grace of God. The conservative highlights the total depravity of man, his total dependence on God, and his absolute need of the grace of God every moment you know of his life much of modern christianity believes that the grace of god is just something that's that's humanly appropriated it's just out there to grab onto when we need it whereas this book declares grace is something unconditionally bestowed and the grace of god is in the sphere of truth you can't you can't take and separate the grace of God from the truth of God. So what I believe that we see from the text in light of the rest of Scripture, which interprets Scripture, that we see that it was God by his determinate power who selected Paul as his apostle. His power, his will, same is true of us, chosen in Christ. That we have grace and peace from God as the Colossians did. 
that one inspired by the Holy Spirit came to the Colossians and talked about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the result was that they trusted in him. Same is true in our lives, which lies in stark contrast to trusting in ourselves. We see that it is God who says that he rejoices that we trust in Christ Jesus that there's always an attitude of thanksgiving and, and an attitude of prayer and worship concerning believers in Christ, not just concern for one another, but God's concern for us. Our hope is preserved in the heavens by the power of God. Nothing can affect that, change that, alter that. That's, that was true for the Colossians as well as us. That they heard the word of the truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ himself, we know, is the word of God. The word of the truth of the gospel being the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What Christ did, that's the good news, folks. Not what we should do or ought to do. That's not good news. You don't bring good news to someone by telling them what you think that they ought to do for God to do something. That's not good news. In fact, trust me on this, a lot of people will, will not, will just flat come right out and tell you that don't sound like very good news to me. You're telling me I've got to do this and that and this, that, and the other thing, you know, for God to do something. And you're, you're telling me that this is good news? Folks, the good news is what Jesus Christ did. That's the good news. That's the gospel. The gospel is what Christ did, not what we must do. Yet modern Christianity has taken and reversed that and made the, the gospel into something that man must do in order for God to do something. And that God has a world system in which he sowed good seed. He bought that field back for the treasure that was in the field. That treasure was you and me. The Colossians, they heard the truth of God's word because God sowed them. Same is true of us. In all the world and in them and us, it is bearing fruit and increasing. Wow. Okay. I, I mean, Folks, stop and think about what the text here is telling you. If you've ever been concerned, the least bit concerned, about whether or not there's fruit in your life, that you're bearing fruit, that, that not only does God say that you are bearing fruit, but that it's increasing. The problem is, is that you, you try to evaluate that by looking outwardly at the flesh. That does not work. That's the old creation. That's the old man. Okay? We're talking about the new creation. So, it is bearing fruit, and it is increasing. The word went where it needed to go because God sent it forth. It will accomplish what he pleases. We don't have to worry that it won't. So many do. We don't have to worry that it won't. He says it will. We participate in the bearing of that fruit, but it is God who causes the growth, which is what God's Word does. Because the only growth that you'll ever know is by means of this book. They not only heard the Word of God, but they knew the grace of God. They knew it. They knew the grace of God. And we know that, that, that grace is the great doctrinal divider between the world religious system and the word of God. And the grace of God rests in the sphere of truth. So, we see the power of God's word in redeeming his people. We see divine election. We see unmerited favor. We see the grace of God resting in his word, which is Christ. God having nothing against us, a guaranteed hope, eternal security, the love of God, and, one, and for one another, our new creation increasingly bearing fruit. We see all of this and more in just the first six verses. 
And there are 95 verses in this epistle. Amazing. I don't think we could begin to plumb the depths, but we can try. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your messages, all of your love, all of your prayers, all of your support. Until next time, thanks for watching.